on World News Tonight. Safe arrivals. All civilian aircrafts make its landing on safe ground since the military withdrawal. Battle plan. New plans revealed by the US president to combat the COVID spread. Combo cure all. Moderna is coming clean with new experiments on a dual purpose vaccine. Revolutionary icon. BMW steals the show with an all new 100% recyclable four wheeler. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from the tensions in the Taliban. A week after the complete withdrawal of U.S. and international forces from Afghanistan, the first evacuation flight carrying civilians safely departed Kabul's international airport, landing in the Qatari capital of Doha. The White House welcomed the safe evacuation, saying it was facilitated thanks to cooperation from the Taliban. The first evacuation flight since the U.S. exit from Afghanistan left Kabul's International Airport Thursday local time and has since landed safely in Doha. According to the AFP, there were some 200 passengers, including U.S. citizens and several other Westerners, on the Qatar Airlines flight. Such a large-scale departure comes as the Taliban vowed to cooperate to facilitate the departure of foreign nationals who wish to leave Afghanistan. The White House also welcomed the safe evacuation. We wanted to note that the Taliban was cooperative in facilitating the departure of these American citizens and legal permanent residents from HKIA. We promised we would get American citizens out. We promised we would get legal permanent residents out. We promised we would get our Afghan partners out. And we promised we'd press the Taliban to get them out. And that's exactly what we did. While Kabul's airport was seriously damaged in the final days of the U.S. airlift that evacuated tens of thousands of people from the country, Qatari authorities noted that experts from Qatar and Turkey had been dispatched for repair efforts, adding the airport was ready to resume international flights. However, the evacuation news comes as journalists in Afghanistan say they've been seriously tortured by the Taliban. For about 10 minutes, about seven or eight people were beating us as much as they could. They would raise sticks and beat us with all of their strength. After they beat us, they saw that we had passed out. They took us to lock us up in a cell with a few others. He said this happened while he was at protests in Afghanistan's Panjshir region this week, expressing concern about what this means for journalism in Afghanistan going forward. When they treat journalists like this, it's possible that journalism will stop in Afghanistan within a few months. It will be destroyed. What we want from the Taliban is for them to be responsible for the security and well-being of journalists. Other journalists have also complained of assaults since the Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan, and some women say they've been forbidden from working for media outlets. Migrants may soon be unable to land on British shores as the country has given the carte blanche to turn away any migrant boats that reach it. However, the plans are not yet clear of all legalities. Crossing the English Channel may be about to get even more dangerous for those seeking a new life in the UK under plans approved by Britain to turn away boats illegally carrying migrants to its shores. Britain's border officials will now be trained to force boats away from its waters, with Prime Minister Boris Johnson's spokesman saying they were looking at safe and legal ways to do so. Charities said the plans could be illegal. Channel Rescue, a citizen patrol group on the English coast, said international maritime law stipulated that ships have a clear duty to assist those in distress. The move risks deepening a diplomatic rift with France over how to deal with the surge of people crossing the English Channel in dinghies. Hundreds of small boats have attempted the journey across what is one of the world's busiest shipping lanes so far this year. This summer saw a record number of attempted crossings. One day in August saw at least 482 migrants making the journey. France's interior minister, Gérald Damanin, has said forcing boats back towards the French coast would be dangerous and that the United Kingdom must stick to its commitments on migrant crossings. In July, France and Britain agreed to deploy more police and invest in detection technology to clamp down on channel crossings. French police have confiscated more dinghies, but they say they cannot completely prevent departures. 
As the Paralympics have come to an end, all eyes are now on the elections after the surprise announcement given by Prime Minister Yoshihida Suga of his resignation. For further details on this, we cross over to Adhidan World News Special Correspondent Rasida Chandradasa reporting now from Tokyo in Japan. Rasida, over to you. Well, Shanali, after the conclusion of Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, all eyes are now on the ruling LDP's leadership election. As we have expected, there were some surprise candidates. Takaiki Sanai-san, a former minister and someone who's very close to Abe Shinzo, announced her candidacy a couple of days ago. Uh, as well as Kono taro the, the crowd favorite and most probably the front runner, he has given some hints that he would uh, stand for the election, but he had not officially claimed that, but we expect him to uh, declare that in a couple of days, even might declare today. So, so far we have three clear candidates. Kishida-san, former foreign minister, Takayaki Sanai-san, a former minister, as well as Kono Taro-san, a former foreign minister, as well as the uh, current vaccination, a very powerful minister. And the former prime minister, Abe Shinzo, his support for the Takayaki San Sanai-san uh, probably have surprised a few, but not us. I mean, Abe-san uh, has his own legacy online and he would definitely expect to support someone who's close to him as to carry his own legacy and also abe san and also the the powerful uh, deputy prime minister aso taro san they have some scandals and they have a couple of issues uh, the buying of election and there was some sakura event that abe san uh, misled the uh, the actual financial regulators spent some money which he was not supposed to spend so these were the issues that were concerned for the general public and both uh, Kishida-san and Kono Taro-san have hinted that they, the people need better answers for those issues. But the other, on the other hand, uh, Takaeji Sanai-san, she belonged to the right-wing part of the LDP. She's extremely hawkish and she's extremely China skeptic. I mean, just, just to give an example, despite being, being, a, uh, being a female, being a woman, she's overwhelmingly opposed uh, the female throne to the Japanese heir. So that means she's opposing any female become the Japanese emperor. And not only that, she, is, she opposed uh, women keeping their maiden names. Surprisingly, Japan is probably the only country in the OECD and one of few countries in the whole world that do not allow women to keep their maiden names after their marriage. And Takaiji Sanai-san is one of the uh, someone who is overwhelmingly opposed changing any rule regarding that. She, she, she's saying that the women should not keep their maiden names, which was surprising, but that shows how much right wing she is. So all eyes on September 29th election, and my bet would be on uh, Kono Taro-san because he clearly leads. Uh, some, some people might support him, like uh, General Secretary Nikai-san, and also the Ishiba-san, who is expected to run, but he has not announced. He might also support uh, Kono Taro-san. Uh, despite Takaiki Sanai and having the uh, Abe Shinzo, the powerful ex-Prime Minister supports, we think her chances are very slim. Over to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Rasita Chandradasa, reporting from Tokyo in Japan. President Vladimir Putin said Russia will provide its neighbor Belarus with around 630 to 640 million dollars in loans by the end of 2022 after meeting his Belarus counterpart Alexander Lukashenko in the Kremlin. Let's cross over to other than a world news special correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia for more Malsha. Yes, Shanali. Lukashenko speaking at a media briefing after the talk said the question of agreeing on a common currency with Russia was not on the agenda. The Russian leader said at a press conference that the total volume of loans from September this year to the end of 2022 will be somewhere around 630 to 640 million dollars. Putin also touched upon the price of Russian gas for Minsk. According to him, at the meeting, the two leaders managed to reach an agreement on the issues that are very sensitive for the Belarusian side, related to the pricing of the Russian energy resources. After a long discussion, it became possible to work out mutually acceptable approaches to the gas issue. Putin said that the price for the Belarus for the Russian natural gas for 2022 will remain at the current year's level. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Malsha Patiraja reporting from Kursk in Russia. 
Following the events after the coup that took place in Guinea, the country has now been removed from the main economic bloc within West Africa. This comes after the economic community of West African state held a gathering on future encounters with Guinea. Guinea has been suspended from West Africa's main political and economic bloc following the weekend military coup that ousted President Alpha Conde. The 15-member Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, held a virtual summit on Wednesday to discuss the situation. Burkina Faso's Foreign Minister Alpha Barry said ECOWAS was demanding a return to constitutional order and the immediate release of Conde and others who were arrested. Barry did not announce any immediate economic sanctions, as ECOWAS did with Mali's coup last year. Some experts say ECOWAS's leverage over Guinea is limited, as the country is not landlocked like Mali, nor is it a member of the West African Currency Union. Guinea's coup leader, Mamadou Doumbouya, has promised a unified transitional government, but has not yet said when or how this will happen. At least 80 political prisoners were released on Tuesday evening. Many had campaigned against a constitutional change which allowed Conde to stand for a third term. The military has also been dismantling forward posts. They were used at the height of the protests against the constitutional change to house police and soldiers. Located in different neighborhoods of the capital Conakry, they facilitated rapid responses. Dumbuya has also met with heads of Guinea's various military branches as he hopes to unify the country's armed forces under the junta's command. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News. Welcome back. Now on to the COVID crisis around the globe. President Joe Biden took aim at vaccine resistance in America, announcing policies requiring most federal employees to get COVID-19 shots within the next 75 days and pushing large employers to have their workers vaccinated or tested weekly. With COVID cases surging and deaths now five times higher than just a month ago, President Biden is requiring tens of millions more Americans to get vaccinated. We've been patient. But our patience is wearing thin, and your refusal has cost all of us. This is not about freedom or personal choice. It's about protecting yourself and those around you. The president is ordering nearly all federal workers and employees of contractors that do business with the federal government get vaccinated within 75 days, eliminating their option to be tested instead of getting shots. Employees who refuse could be punished, even fired. If you want to work with the federal government and do business with us, get vaccinated. While initially reluctant to issue mandates, the president's aggressive new plan requires vaccinations for 17 million health care workers at hospitals and other sites that receive Medicare or Medicaid funding. President Biden's now pressuring private companies, too, directing the Labor Department to require businesses with 100 or more employees ensure their workers are fully vaccinated or provide a negative test each week, a move the White House estimates will impact 80 million Americans. Companies that do not comply could face fines, the White House anticipating lawsuits. We're going to protect vaccinated workers from unvaccinated co-workers. All of it as approval of the president's handling of the virus has dropped since he expressed confidence about the pandemic two months ago. Today, we are closer than ever to declaring our independence from a deadly virus. The president tonight. We're in the tough stretch and it could last for a while. And the TSA is doubling fines for airline passengers who refuse to mask up. If you break the rules, be prepared to pay. And by the way, Show some respect. We have some good news for you. We may soon have a cure-all in our hands as Moderna has revealed experimental plans to combine a flu shot with the COVID-19 vaccine in hopes of garnering greater efficacy into one jab. Moderna is working on a single-dose vaccine that will combine a COVID-19 booster shot along with the flu vaccine, the company said Thursday. Speaking during a company research and development day, CEO Stefan Bonsell said bringing to market an annual booster vaccine that can be customized and upgraded is, quote, our number one priority as a company right now. 
It's not alone in trying to develop a combo COVID-19 flu vaccine with the start of flu season just around the corner. Novavax says it has begun an early stage study to test a combo vaccine. But Moderna had more than just that to talk about during its update. It is currently trying to get its COVID-19 vaccine approved in kids under the age of 12. Mid-stage clinical trials are underway for the right size dose for different age groups. Use of the Moderna vaccine in adolescents is currently under FDA review for approval. That puts Moderna behind rival vaccine makers Pfizer and BioNTech, which got approval for use in youngsters aged 12 to 15 earlier this year. The update was welcomed by investors who sent shares of Moderna more than 6% higher in midday Thursday trading. China is slowing down approvals of new online games. The move comes after the Chinese authorities summoned industry giants Tencent and NetEase to discuss gaming restrictions on minors. China has suspended approval for all new online games. That's according to a report in the South China Morning Post on Thursday. It's thought to be part of Beijing's bid to curb gaming addiction among young people. Citing sources with knowledge of the matter, the report said the decision was revealed at a meeting between Chinese authorities and industry giants Tencent and NetEase. Tencent declined to comment. NetEase did not immediately respond for comment. China moved in August to ban under-18s from playing video games for more than three hours a week. It wants to curb a growing addiction to what it once described as spiritual opium. Chinese gaming and media stocks, including Tencent and NetEase, fell on Thursday, a day after authorities summoned them and other gaming firms to ensure they had implemented new rules for the sector. After the news, Tencent shares shed more than 8%, while NetEase dropped as much as 13%. The tighter gaming regulations come as China conducts a broader crackdown on a wide range of sectors. These include tech, education and property, strengthening government control after years of runaway growth. Hong Kong police raided a closed museum dedicated to the victims of China's 1989 Tiananmen crackdown. The reason for the raid was unclear and comes hours after a dozen pro-democracy activists pleaded guilty to participating in last year's June 4th anniversary. This is the moment Hong Kong police raided the premises of the closed museum dedicated to the victims of China's 1989 Tiananmen crackdown on Thursday. Officers were seen loading a truck with display boards, including one with the June 4th Museum's logo and another carrying a picture of a lit candle. The reason for the raid was unclear. Police did not immediately reply to a request for comment. The museum opened a decade ago. It was closed on June 2nd due to a licensing investigation and reopened online as 8964 Museum. The raid came hours after a dozen pro-democracy activists pleaded guilty of knowingly participating in an unauthorized assembly during last year's June 4th anniversary. Rallies were banned by police citing coronavirus concerns. This year's vigil was banned for similar reasons. Hong Kong traditionally holds the largest commemoration for the victims of the Tiananmen crackdown because mainland China bans such gatherings and heavily censors the topic. On Wednesday, police arrested the vice chairwoman Chao Hang Tong and three other members of the Hong Kong Alliance in support of patriotic democratic movements in China for failing to comply with national security law requirements. The group ran the museum and organizes annual June 4th rallies. Hong Kong authorities have repeatedly denied curbing human rights and freedoms in the city and say law enforcement has made arrests based on evidence. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. The British medical regulator gave the green light to boost the shots of Pfizer and AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccines, saying they are safe and effective. The actual rollout will be determined by the government as Britain's Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunisation is looking into whether booster shots for the elderly and vulnerable are needed. Los Angeles County school officials ordered COVID-19 vaccinations for all students aged 12 and over, the largest school district in the United States to take the dramatic step. 
Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro said he never intended to attack any branch of the government as he sought to defuse a dispute with the Supreme Court in a move that boosted markets. And finally tonight, electric-powered cars on display at Munich's IAA Auto Show no longer stands out as revolutionary technology, but as a vehicle which its makers say is 100% recyclable. BMW's i-version circular concept cars, which its distinctive egg-shaped exterior, an absence of a dashboard screen and seats reminiscent of a 1970s couch are an eye. The German car maker's head of design stated that the general idea of this car revolves around how they can create something which is 100% circular. According to Duke, he and his team integrated the headlights into the grille's double kidney typical for BMW while getting entirely rid of a chrome, sometimes called a climate killer. Duke also said the light is actually the new chrome. BMW says everything used to make the 4 meter short i version circular is secondary material and that they can use the same material of this car to produce a new car. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shanali. Until then, stay safe and have a great weekend.